Welcome to Security Token Stories, brought to you by Security Token Academy, the leading educational platform dedicated to covering and facilitating the security token industry. I'm Derek Edward Schloss, Director of Strategy at Security Token Academy. Dr. Patrick Byrne is the former CEO of Overstock.com and a longtime blockchain technology advocate. Patrick has a bachelor's degree in philosophy and Asian studies from Dartmouth, a master's in philosophy and ethics from Cambridge University, and a doctorate in philosophy from Stanford University. In this conversation, Patrick and I continue an interview we had together in March of 2019, where we talked about Patrick's blockchain tech stack for civilization. We recap the original ideas that Patrick shared, along with an update on how these different efforts are shaping up across the blockchain industry today. We also dive into topics like the role of coronavirus on our current macro environment, recent rate cuts announced by the Federal Reserve, and the role blockchain technology might play in the future in light of these events. Part of the security token journey is understanding how the building blocks adjacent to the security token industry are building out in things like identity, central banking, voting, land titling, and Patrick does an excellent job speaking to the interrelatedness of all of these efforts. I think this turned out to be an excellent episode. I hope you enjoy it. Patrick, welcome to Security Token Stories. Derek, it's an honor to be back on. Awesome. Well, for those who aren't aware, one year ago this month, March of 2019, you and I sat down for a narrative interview that I really enjoyed. And the topic of that conversation was was thinking about the snapping together that you talked about with uh, the component parts of building a blockchain tech stack for civilization. And you argued a year ago that there were six different pillars required to build that civilization from the ground up. There was identity, there's land titling, there's currency and central banking, capital markets, uh, supply chain, and voting. And I thought it would be awesome to get you back on the show one year later for that from that first interview, capture some of the insights from our original conversation, and also hear how your thinking may have evolved um, now that we have kind of a greater information set one year later. Um, how does that sound? That sounds great, Dark. I'd be honored to. Now, just to be clear, I am no longer connected to Overstock or T0 or uh, any of the companies. You know that I retired under some strange circumstances last August, right? I do, yes. And, um, okay. and yep, and we will not be going into those topics today. That's good. Awesome. That's good. Cool. So, so Patrick, uh, to kick things off and um, set the stage for the tech stack conversation, the first thing I'd love to know as it relates to you and the way you view the world, uh, what is Bitcoin? Uh, what is blockchain and why do you believe this stuff is so important for humanity and our evolution and our systems and the way humans organize ourselves and our value in this world? It's so vital for this reason. For 5,000 years, as we have engaged in consensual exchange, uh, strangers, um, we humans, but strangers to each other, we have had to solve a problem called trust. And how do you solve that problem of trust? is what gives rise to lots of different social institutions that you can really see as solving that same problem. And uh, we, we've created institutions, and for thousands of years, we've argued about what the best institutions are. And you know, 500 years ago, this philosophy called liberalism emerged, which was that we, we built our constitution, we designed our constitution to manifest, and we have a set of liberal Philosophical, liberal, philosophically liberal institutions. But the great Achilles heel of this all these years, but especially I might say for, the, for philosophical liberalism, is that when you rely on institutions, what happens when those institutions get corrupted? That's the great question. And in fact, our founding fathers knew it. And if you look up Federalist number 10, Madison says basically that we looked at all the different attempts at democracy, ancient and modern, to figure out what made them fail. And we designed this constitution to block the, the things that make democracy fail. But unfortunately, there's one flaw we couldn't fix, and that's the flaw that brings down republics more than any other flaw. And that is the problem of what we would call special interests today, which really means uh, corruption, capture, and the fact that institutions don't work like they're supposed to. Well, if that's the fatal flaw of the approach we've taken for 5,000 years, mankind has a reason to be joyful now because we can rebuild the function of those institutions within these programs called blockchain 
and they are protected cryptographically. So there's no way they can be cheated. There's no way they can be corrupted. There's no way they can be gained by powerful oligarchies and such. So for that reason, it's really quite a historic moment for mankind because we really have something that will defeat uh, the concept. You know, there's, a, there's a Dartmouth economist, uh, Meyer Cohn, who says he can divide all human activity into um, you know, production, trade, or predation. And there's just some type of humans who are predators by nature. And some of them are criminals and some, some take over governments and they use government to predate. And you can look at a lot of, a lot of countries around the world. What you really have are, in a sense, slave societies where predators run the governments and extract value from their people and their country. So that can all be brought to an end. It's, of course, going to disrupt a lot of entrenched interests. So uh, in both abroad and domestically. So it's really going, but it's kind of funny. Like I was just checking on security. I'm giving you a longer answer than you wanted, but that, that's your answer. That's why it's so important. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, you know, Patrick, in, in preparing for this interview, I actually had a chance to watch a few of your other um, your panels and, and some of the, the, the talks you've given. And I actually came across a video where you mentioned you spoke a bit of Chinese and you were describing this Chinese character. I think it's pronounced Gua and the etymology describes the character as combining three ideas, mouths, right. lands, and spear. So Patrick, what is Gua? Why is this 3,000-year-old Chinese character so important to you and how you think about uh, the blockchain tech stack for civilization? Sure, great question. Gua, as in, it means like kingdom. And it is what, in the Chinese view, it's if you put mouths, meaning people, and land, and an army, a spear, together, that's those the elements of a kingdom. Um, and so I got thinking when I got to understand blockchain six or seven years ago about what the meaning of that was. Uh, if you were coming up with blockchain versions of institutions in our society, what would what are the institutions that you would want to have in blockchain that if you just had that stack, you put them together in a box, it'd be like the Ch 3,000 years ago, the Chinese uh, tech stack was land of people and an army that made a country. We have a more sophisticated ver vision now. And to me, it's, it's identity, land, central banking, capital markets, supply chains, and voting. And if you, if, and if, so we have focused for five years at Medici within Overstock to build out the, to build out companies that work in those areas, blockchain meets supply chains and blockchain meets voting and so on and so forth. And so. Patrick, I want to hear how you think about identity. We can start there with this first pillar. And so, you know, today when I think about identity, I think about, you know, our national and our local governments and they're responsible for maintaining, you know, records like our birth dates and our death dates and our social security numbers and government ID numbers. How do you think about the role of identity and identification today? And why is this such a core pillar um, for the way that you think about this, this tech stack uh, bundle? Well, it's a great question. Uh, the, Derek, the blockchain makes possible what's called self-sovereign ID, ID self-sovereign identity, where you are the owner of your identity. In a sense, right now, you know, there's all these information about you. And when you go to Google, they use that information to sell access to you to advertisers. And I think the average American, they make about a hundred bucks a year off. As you search, as you search on Google over the course of the year, they're making about a hundred dollars off you. Well, because they own all that information about you, maybe you don't even own it. With blockchain, there could be you have an I you you can have a system where you say to Google, I'll only I'm going to be anonymous to you, Google. But it, in, uh, or if you want to use my I control the information about me, and if you want to use it. In order to target, just give me 50% of your revenue uh, that you make off selling me to your advertisers. So that's one thing that self-sovereign identity will do. So when we, when, well, I'm not there anymore, but when I was at Overstock and Medici and we were talking to different countries about bringing in our tech stack, we, some of the countries were saying, well, we see the first application would be uh, moving our I, I, identity records into blockchain. And we said there's already a blockchain solution for that. And it's company called it's something called Sovereign, and Sovereign is spelled a little funny, S O V R I N. But that to me, I mean, we looked at all the different blockchain identity companies, and it just so happened that the one that we think that has the 
the answer that's architected most true to the spirit of blockchain and cypherpunk that allows for true anonymity and, well, I shouldn't say anonymity, and now allows for you to control your identity rather than some corporation or government institution to control it. Uh, uh, so, I said, anyway, that's, that's the layer that's uh, for blockchain identity is sovereign. And there is the sovereign system, and there's a company called Evernim behind it. Patrick, the, the next pillar um, that you walk through is land titling. And I believe the idea here is that a blockchain's immutable ledger can help record and store formal property rights and information for individuals and families who have previously occupied land informally. And this is often seen outside of the United States. Why do you believe land titling is a core pillar here? And um, is this a problem that's typically felt outside the U.S.? And why is blockchain a, a unique solution for, for solving this issue? Great. Again, great series of questions. Uh, it's rule of law begins with land governance because, you know, the first time you have rule of law or some way to make people keep their promises really is when there's some property that the government can point to. Even if they can't find you, they can point to it. And that, that's how kind of rule of law starts. And that's how where the financial system starts because once you have that, and somebody owns this acre of land and they have a deed to it, they can, they can put it down as collateral and, and get capital. Um, and that's how capitalism starts. In fact, there's this theory that that's really what made Britain and the, and the U.S. prosper was we simply got land governance correct. And when we did, it freed up all this capital and, and we boomed for a century and a half. Um, third, I, third world's not a nice word anymore, but developing or less developed countries don't have that kind of rule of law and you're squatting in some favela and you never know if, and maybe your great grandfather built this little cottage and you know, your family's lived there for three generations, but you never know if the local generalissimo shows up someday and says, no, senor, that's my land. That's not, that's my great grandfather settled. It's not yours. I mean, you, know, you don't really have, and because of that, what you own is always quite tenuous and you don't have a reason to improve it. And you don't have anything you can take to a bank and borrow some money and start a business. But if you, but it turns out that even in those areas, in slums and barrios and favelas around the world, there are informal systems where there are local strongmen who keep a book. And that's really recording this sort of informal system that governs this hillside outside Rio, for example. Well, the power always goes to the person who keeps that book. It's always the local strongman. And if it's a government, it's the local, but it's, that's the center of power. That's the center of gravity of, of power. And so the question is always who keeps the database? Well, with blockchain and the, the person who keeps the database has the power. Well, with blockchain, it's like a database that nobody keeps. It's a database that's that, you know, if, so we're building block. Well, I keep saying where I'm still in the habit of thinking myself as part of that series of companies I started, but they are, they are building and they've got contracts in different countries in Africa and are building land governance system. What, what they're doing is they're saying to governments, look, you're not getting any tax revenue from this whole area of your country. How about we can go and make this basic trade where we're saying to people, okay, you're living here. How would you like the government to recognize your ownership? And you're going to pay 50 bucks. And then from now on, you're going to pay you know, $3 a year or something. I don't, I don't know, but or $8 a year but to, in taxes. But the government will recognize your claim to this home that you say your grandfather built and is in this undocumented. Well, it turns out people are lining up to take that deal. They're lining up for that deal. And so it becomes a source of revenue to government where there hasn't been any source before. They're actually, and it's really the first step. I mean, the first trade, the first exchange that government makes should be, okay, we rec in return for you funding me, if we were all out on Gilligan's Island, say, if we were, you know, you could see somebody finally saying, if it were, once the population got big enough and they're dispute, somebody saying, okay, I'll, we'll make a deal. You fund me and I'll just keep, and I will protect your property. You're, you know, we'll agree what your property is and I'll, I will be a police force and I'll protect your right to your property. That's really the first trade that you make when you sign up for the whole government project is you're going to protect me and my stuff before we get to anything else. So to, so to allow these governments in Africa to say, 
okay, we can do something that builds you a revenue stream of 200 million bucks a year from this big ch- chunk of your country, which is just an expense to you now. You know, they can do a lot with $200 million a year. So Patrick, I, you know, I think this, this idea of formal anti-learning has always been kind of interesting to me. I think it's, and you were touching on this, it's people can really start taking recognition of their property and start using that property and uh, in trade with their neighbor. And if the right infrastructure and regulatory environment is set up, eventually in global markets as well, which would really unlock tremendous value for both the individual and the state. And I think this is probably a, a good transition into the next core p- pillar, which is capital markets. Um, so you and I actually talked about this quite a bit in our first conversation. The question I asked you back then when when I brought up that this third core pillar of, of capital markets was a quote from the former NASDAQ chairman, Robert Greifeld, who said that 100% of the stocks and bonds trading on Wall Street uh, today would eventually be tokenized. And so this idea of blockchain-based digital securities is really the heartbeat for the security token movement. And I guess m- my questions are, you know, why is capital markets, in theory, a core part of the tech stack in, in your in your belief? And then now that it's been a year since we spoke, I'm I'm curious if you still subscribe to um, that belief that that all publicly traded assets will eventually be tokenized. I do think they will all eventually be tokenized. What's happened in the last year, I think, is the empire has struck back in that I think that the en- enormous disruptive nature of these have. Uh, of security tokens have settled across Wall Street. And to be honest, now I couldn't talk this way when I was in a publicly traded company. But uh, I can tell you, it's funny, and I even wrote a blog where I described how a few years ago, a couple years ago anyway, it seemed like the SEC was almost tapping its toes and checking its watch, saying to us, how quickly can you get it? How quickly can you get built? Can you get you know, and it was kind of a strange feeling because we were, had been, I'd been expecting you know, just roadblocks. And of course, they're always in the mode of kind of kicking your ass when they talk to you. So they were kicking my ass simultaneously, but saying, but how quickly can you get it done? I shouldn't say that. They were actually lovely people that I dealt with. But since I've left, I'd say since you and I spoke a year ago, I think what's happened, well, put it this way, it used to be that they were saying that and we were scrambling and working nights and weekends to build the technology. The technology is already. I'd say, if anything, things have shifted where, uh, well, that's not the critical path item anymore. What's the critical path item for this to really go live is TZO did a joint venture with a Boston exchange. These folks in Boston are nice, clean-cut people that the SEC likes and I think has reason to like. They're owned by Canadians. They're sort of good old fat. They're like people who used to be on Wall Street 40 years ago. Uh, so that, when I left, or sometime in the fall, that final rule book got submitted and the SEC last I heard that the company was projecting that like maybe by this spring that would all get approved. Once that gets approved, there's a full legal regulated exchange that they can do IPOs and do anything. That's probably when, when that final approval comes from the SEC. So it moves from being sort of a science project within T0, which still has, you know, there's real estate companies coming and other, well, last I heard, that there, there's a pipeline of companies who are working their way through the, their legal requirements to do security tokens. But, oh, like, like um, I mean, there were thousands who had contacted us. But as I recall, you know, like there's, I don't know, 60 vetted companies or 300 vetted companies or something, but real companies that, um, but again, that's, they can sort of do it with Reg S and Reg D exceptions, like we did. Uh, we did the, the T zero one, but if they want to have a general offering to the public, I think they need to generally wait until that uh, that Boston Security Token Exchange gets the SEC holy water sprinkled on it. And but if anything, I guess what I'm saying is, it feels like in the last year, now that I'm out of the company. I can say this, it feels like if anything, the regulators started to maybe drag their feet a bit. And it's almost, my sense is there is lobbying going on from in current Wall Street interest to slow down security tokens. I think that's what started happening about a year ago because they realized the truth of that quote you gave me. Great, Patrick, let's, um, let's move to the fourth pillar, currency and central banking. And I think this... This next core pillar of the tech stack is one I find fairly interesting, especially in its interplay 
uh, over the last year with natively digital bear cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin and um, CBDC, central backed digital currencies? Sure. The, tech, the, the next step would be central bank digital currencies. And Overstock slash Medici funded a company down in Barbados, which built just that. A central bank, uh, uh, a, a blockchain central bank. And last I heard, it was going live in March. I mean, this is information from six months ago, so who knows. But that with the First Nation, which is the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank, uh, Eastern Caribbean, Eastern Caribbean, Caribbean Currency Union, and it was going live. And there's about eight different countries or nine different island countries in the Caribbean that share one currency called the Eastern Caribbean dollar. And that was going live in digital version. But uh, I think that it's, I think that our government has, has two minds about this. On the one hand, they don't like the anonymity, but boy, some smart people who are understanding the global financial situation are, and it's, been a delight to see this only in the last few weeks people are getting this the, their way of propping us up through the next global financial meltdown which may be upon us through coronavirus is how they always do which is free money cheap money q and d well what's that is central banks in one way or another printing money different names for it they call it this call it that it, it's effectively the same effect giving well there's a phenomenon called a cantillion effect which is that the players in the economy who were wired most, think of the economy as a bunch of concentric circles around that central bank. The innermost concentric circle tied in directly to the central bank gets the biggest benefit from the Cantillion effect. And the outside uh, circle, which is just the ordinary consumer, or ordinary schlo, schmo, has by the time, very, very little drizzled out to them. And so, but for the... But for the banks who are, you know, for the big banks, they had a game after 2008, they've had a game for years where you can borrow for free from the central bank and lend it back to the government and, and make uh, 100 bips, 100 uh, basis points. So uh, the Cantillion effect really just benefits. It says that, that doing QEs, different forms of QE, quantitative easing, really benefits the elite. True helicopter money would be you know, dumping money from a helicopter where the expression comes from. You could do that if you had a, you could do that very easily to the citizenry if you had a digital central bank uh, currency uh, be, because everyone would just, you, you could pump money into the economy first through the actual people and then that would come back and benefit to some degree the institutions. So I've actually seen in the last few weeks people starting to speculate about that. It, there, there is an advantage to governments, including our government, if, if they're thinking about what to do in a financial crisis, the quicker they let us, well, the, let, the quicker they let our industry roll out a blockchain-based currency, the quicker the government will have a way to uh, pump things up and get us through a crisis without it being, without the benefit being sucked away by that contagion effect. You know, Patrick. Yeah, this is actually we're hitting on a a, a, a timely piece of um, a news. You know, when we're recording this today, the Fed actually just uh, released a, an alert this morning. Um, you're fairly well read on a number of topics, and so with you being here, it would be fun to kind of explore this before we jump back into the rest of the um, the blockchain tech stack for civilization. I'm curious to hear your views, if you have any. Um, between uh, uh, the the individual and the state around the information around coronavirus and COVID nineteen and how information has flowed and and how a number of different governments around the world have responded, I'm I'm curious to hear your take on this. It's timely and topical to to some of today's conversation. Well, I think it's going to be an opportunity for us to ultimately test the Achilles heel of liberalism versus the Achilles heel of authoritarianism. And their information dominance and insistence on information dominance may make them more fragile in the face of this virus. I think it could be uh, have dramatic effects for China, uh, even if the United States defeats it. You know, defeats a pandemic domestically. Understand this could really disrupt our financial system, just because of all the other countries that are are going to uh, you know because the supply chains are going to break in other countries, China, India. Um, so, and I do think they're going to break. So that could dramatically, that could take down the U.S. economy, even if we never have a case, uh, even if we solve it domestically. And 
I think that people should be prepared. They shouldn't panic, but they should be prepared and read. Uh, it's kind of funny. I'm talking with one per- I haven't done any interviews really for six or seven months, but I'm doing one with a very intelligent woman at a mainstream sort of a par- epigony of mainstream journalism. And we've been talking, she's doing a story for a couple months now. And there's a, we've been talking as the coronavirus issue has been surfacing. And she, I, she has the snootiness of the mainstream media towards the alternative press. On the other hand, she's a mother and she really wants to know. And I'm pointing out to her, if you really want to know what's going on, you can't wait for it to appear in the mainstream press. You got to be looking in the alternative press. And there's going to be inter- I'm sure there's going to play a role in her article when it comes out because you know, she's like the proverbial Christian scientist with appendicitis. She wants to be all mainstream journalism and about, about stuff, but she's actually, she's a mother, and so she's really interested in these other articles, too. It's going to be funny to see how she writes, what she says in the end. So that's, I think it's quite serious, and the way, by the way, the way they're going to snuff it out, the way you snuff out a pandemic, that you can stop it by containment, which is you keep people off your borders. Next phase will be, they'll be telling everyone everywhere, wear a mask, and wash your hands, constantly but the last phase is they just say shelter in place and you stay in your home for 15 to 30 days and if you do that that will snuff out a pandemic the way that you do that is go to overstock.com search for emergency supplies you will find there's a whole bunch of kits there you just pay like 200 bucks and a backpack shows up in your house and the backpack has everything for a family of four for a month and it's got freeze dried food and it's got a whistle and compass and basic survival stuff but it's just one, make one choice. You buy one backpack and it all shows up loaded with everything for you. And that's, if people are nuts. If they're not taking it seriously enough to get at least two weeks and preferably 30 days of food in their, in, uh, in their households, because what will happen if it, if it comes is you get the shelter in place order and you stay inside and that snuffs the virus out. Yeah. So actually, Patrick, a couple of things in there that you said that were that was fairly interesting. I'd love to unpack. And I actually think this ties nicely to the fifth core pillar, which is supply chain. This is the fifth pillar of your tech stack. You mentioned that you do think that the supply chain will break down. Um, a lot of our, a lot of the manufacturing uh, done worldwide goes through places like India and China. And I'm curious. You know, we actually hear this example used frequently as a prime example showcasing blockchains. This idea that if you leverage the immutability of a ledger to aid in the tracking of goods as they kind of move and change hands across a goods life cycle, um, the process will, 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 will be improved. I, I, I'm curious to hear how you're thinking about the role of supply chains as part of the tech stack thesis. Um, how does this interplay with some of the rest of the tech stack and how does some of the events unfolding um, maybe change or improve that thesis? Well, good questions. Well, one thing is there's more fugazi, which sounds like a dirty word, but it's not. It's Italian for it means something that's made it's and but it's it, it's slang for something that's fake, and there's more fugazi products in the in the supply chains than people know. And I'm not talking about just fugazi Gucci and Christian Dior. I'm talking about in the medical supply chain and wine and food. So blockchain does solve all of that. In addition, it can make the supply chains much smarter. So Overstock, Medici invested in one supply chain company for grain called Grain Chain. And boy, did they build a tremendous product in the last year I saw just before I left, where the the system by which farmers, even in this country, let alone Mexico, you know, uh, farm their land, fill up a truck with grain, and then they drive to some some collection center in the center of Texas, and they and you know their truck is weighed, and they dump the grain. Their truck is weighed again. There's a whole, and then they get paid on a certain schedule. There's all these aspects of it that are sort of 1940, circa 1940. You can't, and that is all going to get fixed. And the grain chain has already built the system that fixes that. There's farmers using it in the U.S. and in Mexico, as I recall. So it just makes, and you can make the supply chain. In some countries, 30% of the food that's produced actually rots. It rots or gets eaten by rats because uh, the supply chains aren't smart. Again, that kind of thing can all be fixed. So maybe we don't need more food. Maybe we have enough food in the world. We just need smarter supply chains. You know, Patrick, listening to you talk, I'm, I'm not as well read on the supply chain 
blockchain solutions as others, but something I've definitely thought about as it relates to other areas of inputting data into blockchains is this, this tension between the immutability of a distributed ledger itself with the humanity of the data inputs themselves. So making sure off-chain reporting and integrity of data inputs are accurate. And we see this across all aspects of the blockchain industry. You know, you know the expression garbage in, garbage out. And so do you imagine that these supply chain solutions eventually blend with other technologies like Internet of Things and 5G to kind of mitigate the human touch in these supply chain systems? I guess, I, you know, I'm not as exposed to some of these issues as you are. I'm curious to hear how you're thinking about this. That's exactly what it's going to do. And it's not going to happen all at once with some massive switch over from one system to another. It's just that these systems are infiltrating the, the overall system as it exists. And as these systems infiltrate, they shave out all these back office costs and they shave out all these errors. It will just gradually in kind of a Leninist style take over from the inside. You know how Lenin could take, he had all these, revolutionary techniques like taking over an organization from within where you infiltrate enough of your people into it. And then they, you know, that's what we're doing with blockchain. It's going into banks, back offices. It's going into uh, the grain supply chain. Over time, these will all start finding each other and linking and, and the other stuff will wither away. Okay. Patrick voting is the, um, it's the last core pillar for your tech stack of civilization. I think this one is actually fairly timely right now. We have an upcoming presidential election coming up here in the U.S. with some history and baggage there with some alleged you know, past interference in, in our previous election. I'm also n not sure if you've been following the primaries at all in the Iowa caucus trouble with some of the mobile app reporting that happened back in February. Um, you know, I'd, I'd imagine if the, some of the, some of our legacy voting systems in the U.S. are continuing to have trouble in 2020. I can only, you know, imagine what some of these processes might look like in in other places without the same amount of resources. Well, they learned the wrong lesson from Iowa, and the lesson is we don't want any mobile voting on our phone. Uh, well, maybe you don't want any mobile voting on your phone when a company controlled by Hillary Clinton and the DNC is building the system. Uh, I think that they, I think that you do want mobile voting if it's blockchain based. First of all, Americans have to know something. Don't believe the people who tell you that voter uh, fraud is a myth. It's not a myth. They know it's not a myth. It's quite significant. It's, it's much more significant than people want to admit. And talk to anybody who works at the grassroots level in uh, can tell you about it. Anyone who works in the voting station just have, has their own stories. And for that to work, they want it to stay paper. Paper doesn't guarantee anything. There's all kinds of ways to cheat a paper-based uh, voting system. Uh, the last thing certain elements in our society want is for the vote to be true. Uh, and there's different ways of suppressing a vote. I mean, suppressing votes is awful. One way is to you know, a poll tax or make people recite the constitution or something like they used to do in the South. Another way to suppress your vote is to let you vote, but me to engineer a fake vote that offsets your vote. That's just another way I suppress your vote. And it seems that some people in our society are concerned about one type of voter suppression, but they're completely blind to the other way votes get suppressed. And they get suppressed when you let people enter fake votes. And there's so much more of it. And it's curious to me how adamant, I have to say, some people are that, oh, there isn't enough voter fraud to worry about. It's such, it's so intellectually honest, dishonest. Go dig into the arguments. You know, it's funny. Uh, I didn't vote for Hillary or Trump, so I'm just letting you know. But last time Hillary won New Hampshire, and she won by 3,000 votes or 1,800 votes or something. Well, on the day of voting in New Hampshire, 5,000 people showed up at the polls uh, from Massachusetts and said, uh, I've just moved to New Hampshire and I, I get to vote today. And, uh, and they signed some document that says they have moved to New Hampshire and they voted. Somebody did an analysis a year later, how many of those 5,000 people had actually moved or had a, applied for driver's licenses? And I think the answer was about 200. In other words, there were basically 5,000 fake votes cast from people coming up from Massachusetts, most likely. Uh, and, you know, 
and Hillary won by 3,000 votes, uh, won New Hampshire by 3,000 votes. There's much more of that stuff going on in the system than, than people uh, want to admit. So a, uh, I think a blockchain voting app tied to your phone, it also is good for old people and handicapped people and vets. That's really where it's making inroads now. The, the, the company is called Vote. It's another Medici portfolio company. And it's making inroads in uh, it's making inroads in like uh, states that want their vets to be able to vote, you know, from uh, when they're overseas. Or I think there was one that was Denver or somebody who did it for their for their for ADA compliance. Well, that's what's going to start happening. ADA is going to let people to start demanding, you know, ha- handicapped people who don't want to go to the polls in every state. They're going to start demanding it. And then it'll probably spread. To kind of close this out, Patrick, you know, what else gets you excited about blockchain technology? What gets you so jazzed up about the stuff being built in the space? And, um, you know, are there other use cases outside of the tech stack you think are interesting? You know, is this a, oh, yeah. you know, an, opti- an optimization thing that you like? Or is this kind of the new value areas being unlocked? I guess what, what gets you up in the morning and gets you so excited about thinking about the potential here? Well, there's, there's dozens and dozens of other areas. I just picked the ones that I think that governments are going to be the most interested in. And if you want to have sort of a, if you want to take a corrupt society and fix its corruption and put in a t- that tech stack, that at the most core level, those processes of from, from identity, land governance, central banking, capital markets, supply chains, and voting are the most core processes to fix. Uh, but yeah, I hear, well, I think that we're going to have uh, crises. I think that blockchain adoption is going to come when other systems have crises. And I do think, I, I used to say that I, I feel I, I just need a couple more years to finish this tech stack because what we want to have is a parallel, robust alternative from the world of blockchain when the current systems vapor lock and fail. Uh, and today I'll note the Federal Reserve did an emergency uh, dropping of the interest rate of the, uh, yeah, for the ninth time in history. First time since 2008, they dropped it half a basis point. Um, I'm not sure the coronavirus is something we can lift, liquefy our way out of because it isn't all about U.S. activity. It's about these global supply chains. So... Um, that's really a, uh, so what I got excited about or what was getting me excited was getting up and getting this stuff built before the big one came. Cause I knew the big one was going to come. I didn't know what was going to trigger it. Coronavirus may be the approximate cause, but the big one's going to come. And I wanted to have these alternative systems ready uh, to switch over to, but what is happening, I have to say is the, the, the establishment, the Visa and MasterCards and the wall street have all come to understand that this is a uh, that this is not a science project anymore. This is stuff that in five, ten years could displace the. I mean, you could you could make a. Once you have blockchain identity, you don't need Airbnb anymore. You don't need Uber. That can all be functionality that is built into your blockchain identity solution. It's and all the functions of Uber and Airbnb can be stripped down into apps that are running within the blockchain identity. So there's, I mean, just the massively disruptive potential to elites that this represents has become, they've become really cognizant of it. Yeah. Patrick, as always, I really enjoyed uh, talking with you about all of these topics. Um, as I've mentioned before, I, I, I enjoy how you're thinking about the blockchain and security token spaces and the impact um, these technologies will have across our systems in the future. We're going to have to make this an annual event, bringing you back on the show. Um, Deal. Derek, I look forward to it. Okay. Where can people find you online, Patrick? Where can they learn more about the things you're uh, you're working on? Deep Capture. Deep <laughs> Capture. Go to deepcapture.com. Or Minds. I'm sorry. Minds.com is another place to go. Awesome. Well, thank you, Patrick. Bye-bye, Derek. That's it for this week's episode of Security Token Stories. For more Security Token content, visit us online at securitytokenacademy.com and subscribe to our newsletter, The Security Token Edge which lands in your mailbox each weekend. You can also keep up with the latest security token news by following us on Twitter, Telegram, YouTube, Facebook, and Medium. Before we go, a big thank you to Security Token Academy's platinum and gold corporate members who make this podcast possible. 
You can learn more about Security Token Academy's corporate members at securitytokenacademy.com. I'm Derek Edward Schloss. From all of us here at Security Token Academy, thanks for listening. Security Token Academy does not provide investment or legal advice. We are not a registered broker-dealer or investment advisor. Opinions expressed in this podcast are the speaker's own and do not necessarily reflect the views of Security Token Academy. More information can be found on our website at securitytokenacademy.com.